Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Can someone send a message so that I know that uh, I'm live now? Before I start to get into the message, I'd like to know that uh, you are receiving this. Get my phone. Sorry, technicalities here. Uh, someone just tell me if this is being seen. Okay, thank you very much. Not bad. Time of worship is reminding us that if indeed, through all the storms and challenges of life, Christ is indeed our cornerstone, which appropriately uh, is the theme of what I'll be sharing today. And uh, I would like to actually start off by asking you to join me in prayer, uh, because just the last couple of hours I've been following the news, and uh, there are over 30 cities in the United States where they're experiencing uh, riots and trouble. And I think of our community here, uh, many of our American brothers and sisters, or citizens of the USA, uh, who have family and friends and churches and relationships in some of those cities. And apart from all of that, they're still going through and dealing with the pandemic. We want to take a bit of time to pray for uh, their family and loved ones, and also for some of our community who may be making plans to return to the United States uh, over summer. And with all of this trouble, obviously their, their plans are uh, affected. So just join me in that quick prayer. Loving Lord, you are indeed the cornerstone through the storms of life. And certainly across many of the cities in the US, they are experiencing quite turbulent storms. Storm of the COVID-19, and also this storm of protests and violence. So we just want to pray for our brothers and sisters here who have relatives and children, churches, friends, loved ones uh, in some of those cities, and I'm sure there is a level of concern anxiety even, and worry. But here really, O oh Lord, we have to seek this peace that passes all understanding, peace that only you can give. Give them the assurance that you, Christ, our cornerstone, is in the storm with us. And you are in control, O oh Lord. We can only turn to you uh, for that peace that you can give. We also pray for the leaders of the nation, for the governors and the mayors and the police chiefs who have to make uh, very important decisions at this time. And I pray that you will raise up the church in America to pray over this situation and to have discerning hearts as to what you are doing and not doing in their midst. So we commit this situation to you in the name of all names, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you for joining me in that prayer. And let's continue to keep uh, our American brothers and sisters in our in this series that David, Greg, and I are doing in Paul's letter to the Philippians. Uh, last week, David shared with us up to verse 4, and today, as I have mentioned to you in, uh, in our line group, I would like you to look at Philippians chapter 2 and verses 5 to 11. Now, this passage is actually 
one of the uh, most important theological uh, revelations about the person and work of Christ. And it can be broken down into three parts, as we will be reading it shortly. The first one is who he, that is Jesus, who Jesus was. Secondly, what Jesus did. And thirdly, what will happen because of what he has done. So if you have your passage before you, uh, you can join me and let's declare the word of the Lord aloud. You can read it with me. So Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. In our relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on the cross. Therefore, God has exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. May the Lord bless to us the reading the understanding, and the keeping of his word. I would like to look at the theological revelation of this passage, and then we will look at the application in our lives. So let's begin with who he was. Or we can ask ourselves, who was he? Was Jesus just another Jew? born in uh, an unknown town called Bethlehem. The scripture clearly tells us this is not so. He was not just any other man. He was God. Jesus was and is obviously God. He was God and he was one person in the all-existent trinity. Jesus is the one person who existed before he was born. And we theologically call this the pre-existent Christ. We have, uh, which is largely theologically accepted by the church and biblical scholars, that he was the fourth person in the furnace with Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you look in Daniel chapter 3, verse 25, when the three friends were thrown in the furnace because they refused to bow to uh, Nebuchadnezzar's gods, there was a fourth person when they looked in the furnace. Apart from being amazed that they weren't harmed, there was another person in there. And the description of this fourth person was that he had the appearance like a son of the gods. So he wasn't, his appearance wasn't even like that of a human being as they could recognize Shadrach, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But he had a special appearance like a son of the gods. Now, John also clearly reveals, John chapter 1, Jesus as the pre-existent word who was with God and who was God. So this is what Paul is talking about, that when he says Jesus being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped as it is uh, translated in some versions. So when Paul tells us to take on the mindset of Jesus, he's not just referring to another man's opinion. 
he is referring to the mind of the Creator, the heart of God, and the one who has always existed. Secondly, let's look at what he did. He surrendered his rights as God. And he did that to die for our sin so that we might live eternally. Or in other words, he paid our debt for us. We all know that we sin. Right from our earliest age, nobody teaches us. I don't think any of us has had a lesson on how to lie or how to do something wrong. Our parents spend so much of our childhood teaching us to do what is right. But how is it that we instinctively know how to do what is wrong? And we all know that we are sinful. And we are all in debt. I can't clear Greg's debt if I am also in debt. If, if I try to clear his debt, I'll just have a bigger debt. And if he comes back to try and clear my debt, he will end up back with his debt. So it goes nowhere. Uh, two or a group of people in debt can't settle their debts. So Jesus was the only one, only human being to come without sin or without debt could pay for us. This is so clear to me yesterday evening as I was thinking of the message and I was uh, trying to seal my roof because it's been leaking uh, with the onset of rains. And I had one hand dirty and it had paint on it. And I uh, tried to use this hand to, to clean this one. And this one had paint too. And all that happened was I ended up messing up both hands even more uh, because they both were tainted. And it's such an appropriate analogy for what sin is. So finally, when I finished painting, after messing up the brush and my feet and everything else, I had to come down and I had to use a cleaner or a cleanser to take away my sin or my, my dirt. I had to take, use the cleaner to take the paint off my fingers. Now, this morning, I'll tell you, my fingers are still a little raw because I had to scrub out the paint. Uh, so I have a memory of the paint that was on my hands, but they're no longer stained. They're, they're all clean now. And I think that's a fair analogy for our sin. Uh, we have the memory, we, we know we are sinful, and yet the blood of Jesus is like the ultimate cleaner uh, that has taken away all of the stain of our sins. So what will happen or what is to come? We know who he is. He is God. He has always existed. He came, he gave up his rights in heaven so that he might come here and die as an innocent criminal. It's almost an oxymoron in terms to die as an innocent criminal uh, so that we may be free of sin. But what does all this add up to? What is going to happen with this? It's just, did the story end there? No, absolutely not. Because he died for our sin, but he also rose again. He rose to prove us, to prove to us that he has the power over death. And this is what is going to happen to mm -hmm. us. We are not going to perish. God so loved the world that whoever believes in him should not perish, but should rise again and have eternal life. Hallelujah. And he was able to do this and give us a future in our Father's house because he fulfilled all of God's will. And because he did this, he will be exalted above everything. Everything and everyone will be subject to the authority of Jesus. That is what is to come. Uh, over these last few days, just with what is happening in the U.S., there's so much talk about justice. 
and what that means. And you can hear many, many different arguments and facets to it. Who finally decides what is justice? And this is the assurance that we have of what is to come. Finally, because of Christ's obedience, everything and everyone in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, which is a scriptural way of referring to even the demonic realm and those who rebel against God, in heaven, on earth, and even under the earth, everyone will have to bow, which is submit to the authority of Jesus. He is the final arbiter. And so in Revelation, at the end of Revelation, we have the opening and the declaration of the sixth seal, the final seal. And at that point, we have this phenomenon of silence in all of creation, where Jesus has laid down the final judgment. And I believe he offers a time. Is there any objection? It's like when in the old days when we posted the, the wedding bands beforehand and then at the wedding ceremony, we had to say, if anyone has objection as to why this man should not be joined to this woman in holy matrimony, please stand up and speak. Otherwise, forever hold your peace. And I believe that that is what will happen when we are gathered around the judgment seat of God and God reveals everything to us. And keep in mind that I believe at that point we will all have the capacity to understand as well. We will no longer see as through a glass. We will see face to face. We will have the full capacity to understand the purposes of God. And when Jesus makes the final judgment, all of creation will be silent for 30 minutes. And that's one of the things I look forward to. The magical 30 minutes in all of history when we will see and understand and comprehend the wisdom, the beauty, the completeness of God's purposes and His heart for all of us. Oh, what a blessed silence that will be. Blessed, more blessed than any silence we can experience during, during this lockdown. So that is the theological breakdown of this passage, of who Jesus is, of what He has done, and what he will do or what is to come. So let's spend the remaining moments that we have looking at the application, the practical application, if you've not already worked out some, the practical application of this in our lives. Last week, I was blessed by David's message. Just to quickly say, I'm always blessed when, by David and Greg as they share their heart two wonderful brothers who have the heart of God and I'm always uplifted by their insights and sharing. But last week David spoke about the mind of Christ <coughs> and it really made me think about what it is to have the mind of Christ. Here in verse 5 we see Paul exhorting the Philippians to have the mind of Christ or the mindset of Jesus. Many people like to claim their rights. I think that is across all nations. To be a citizen of a country, uh, except maybe North Korea and, and a couple of nations like that, in, in most or in many other countries, the citizens have rights. Uh, an organized country, and certainly a country recognized by the United Nations, will need to have a constitution. And it is by your constitution that the United Nations either recognizes you or does not recognize your country. Uh, so people like to claim the rights that we have. Apart from the rights of a citizen, we talk about human rights, that basically as a human being, we have certain rights. I'll just quickly put in a peg there about people who believe in evolution. If we have evolved from amoeba and, and 
various forms of animals, then why do we talk of rights? The reason we speak of rights is because intrinsically we have been made in the image of God and our instincts, our very being, tells us there is a morality. There is a morality in the universe. If we have evolved, there's no real explanation. Morality becomes a convenience, not an institution. So there is, in the fabric of creation amongst us, that human beings have fundamental rights. Now, the best example of a group of people uh, who champion their rights is this group of people who call themselves sovereigns. Uh, you can go on YouTube and just enter sovereigns, and, and you'll see a whole lot of bizarre clips of people claiming that they are not subject to the laws of the country because they are sovereign citizens. We recently had such a case in Singapore. You know, Singapore, like many countries, is under lockdown and it's required by our laws that you have to wear a mask uh, when you go out in public. It's not an option. You have to wear a mask. But there was this video of a lady who was walking around without a mask and many people coming up to her and even offering her a free mask. And she refused them. And uh, when they said, why won't you wear a mask? And she says, I don't have to. And the reason she gave was, I'm a sovereign. I don't have to follow the laws of the country. And of course, this video or several videos went viral of this lady claiming she had the rights of a sovereign, which meant she didn't have to follow the laws of the country. And of course, everyone watching those videos uh, vilified, pilloried her in a very many negative comments. I and mean, there was this viral outrage over her attitude. And I must say, I, I, uh, I followed, I, I looked at the video, I followed some of the comments, and, and of course, I, I felt this was silly. And, and, uh, and, and this lady was crazy to, to, to disregard the laws of the country and claim that she had the right to do so. Uh, but I just discovered this last Wednesday, this last week, how quickly we point the, at the speck in someone's eye when we may have a beam in our own. Uh, so I'd like to share this to my shame. On Wednesday, Lynn and I went to the MK restaurant near our home. And when we walked in, after going through all the entry protocols, we were ushered to separate tables. Uh, and the way the tables were configured, she was at the far end with her table in front of her, a row of seats facing her, a row of seats facing me, and then a table, and then I'm seated on this end with two tables and two rows of chairs between us. Uh, and, and I was, uh, frankly, a little upset over this. Like, this is my wife. <coughs> We're together 24-7 now. And, and we come in here and, you, and we can't sit together. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So I took out my phone and I took a photo of it. Some of you are friends with me on Facebook. And I posted that on, on uh, my Facebook. And, and I just said, this new normal seems a little abnormal to me. Uh, and by the time I finished dinner, I, I had quite a few comments and responses to my post. Uh, everyone basically agreeing with me that, that this was taking uh, the measures, the distancing measures a bit too far. That you're walking in with your wife and you can't even sit with her over a meal. Uh, and, and I've appreciated the comments. I felt a bit justified of my rights uh, to have a meal with my wife. Uh, and I went over, I went home. But the next morning when I woke up, I just felt strangely disturbed. And, and I thought about it a bit more in the presence of the Lord. And I realized it was my mistake 
it, it, it wasn't an error on the part of the restaurant. It was actually a flaw in my thinking. And, and I realized that, you see, we may be husband and wife and we may be spending time together all the time. But let's say for one moment that both Lynn and I were infected with the virus and we were asymptomatic. We don't feel unwell and we don't know we have it. We walk into that restaurant. If they let us sit together at the same table, even though the others are distanced correctly, but because we are sitting together, we take our mask off to eat, obviously. And because we are together, we are going to be talking a whole lot more. And we know that one of the most effective channels of the spreading of this virus is speech. And as we chat, we will be putting out not only the volume, but the density of this virus into the environment. And there will be people who would walk past and we, and we don't know, they, they might inadvertently, the waitress might get it on her apron uh, and then later touch her face or, or some little kid may, may run by in the restaurant and, and pick up our contagion. So they were right. I was wrong. Because by separating us that far, we obviously didn't talk. We, we, we ate our meal and, and then we put our mask on and we left the restaurant. And the restaurant was actually bearing a cost. Because if they put couples at the same table, they can have more people in there. By putting one person at each table, and I noticed that this was uniform <coughs> throughout the restaurant, they were bearing the cost of keeping our rights to health and safety. And so that uh, Thursday morning, I immediately put up that order again and posted my reflection and I made an apology. I apologize for having the wrong attitude and being hasty uh, in my conclusions at what appeared to me at first to be obvious. And, and I felt perhaps I experienced this uh, so that it would make sense in, in this passage. What is the mind of Christ? I think the mind of Christ is, is not to rush, rush to hasty conclusions, instinctively defaulting to wanting to protect our rights first. So let's think about that passage that we read. Jesus had every right as he was God and he was equal with God the Father. He had every right to stay in heaven. But he gave up that right. And that is the mind of Christ, where we give up our rights to certain things in order to safeguard and improve the rights of others around us. What an inspiring and challenging thought that may be. And that is why Paul was able to say, count others better than yourselves. That's not to say that we think lowly or poorly of ourselves, that, oh, Greg is so much more handsome, uh, David is so much more talented, which, which they are. But that, that's not what I'm talking about. It's about thinking, what does Greg or David need in this situation? Uh, how can I help them? Or do I just claim my rights first and then give what's left over? And I believe that when we have this mindset, it pleases God, because this is the mind of God. And how can we develop this mindset? I think there's a simple way, and I'd like to almost leave you with that. The mind of Christ is developed, developed by having a relationship with Christ by spending time in His presence, by reflecting upon the experiences in our lives and asking God to speak to our heart and to reveal to us what is true. I, I really believe the, the Holy Spirit corrected my attitude about the restaurant. Uh, 
and and it showed me that I was wrong and giving me the ability to apologize and to accept that, to confess that, and not to sit on a high horse and refuse to admit uh, the error of my judgment. And I think when we try to uh, speak and address what is true, that is what Jesus God. So I would like to encourage you that as Paul did to the Philippines to put on the mind of Christ uh, to walk continually every moment of every day in the presence of God and to always challenge ourselves how would Jesus want us to look at this situation to ask the Lord for wisdom and understanding and I would like to encourage you to do that and as we close our time together, I would like you to I would like to share this uh, saying that I came across. I, I don't even know uh, who said it, but it was sent to me. You know, in one of these pictures that people uh, put on the internet. But it said, or it says, humility is not thinking less about ourselves; it's thinking about ourselves less and thinking of others more. I'll say that again, it's just so nice. Humility is not thinking less about ourselves. It's thinking about ourselves less. The thinking of others more. And I believe that is the mind of Christ. He was in very nature God. He didn't think about any less of that. But I think he spent the bulk of his time thinking about his father's will and his father's children. And that is the mindset I pray that we can all develop. So let me close us in prayer. Loving Lord, we can only thank you that you did not count equality with God the Father and the Holy Spirit something to be grasped. You did not count the glory and the entitlement that you had and have in heaven something to be held on to. You gave up your rights so that we might be saved, so that we might be blessed. So we thank you for the precious gift of your life and your love. And we pray that you keep us close to your heart each and every moment of our lives. Help us to walk in the wisdom and the counsel of your word and by the leading and the prompting and the illumination of your Holy Spirit each day as we journey on. We commend ourselves to you with the work that you are doing in our lives in the lives of those around us. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'll hand over. Kind thank you for uh, giving me a year. And, and I pray that Spirit will convict your heart that which is of the truth of the living God. So I'll pass this time over to Greg to lead us in prayer. Have a great day. Have a great week. Blessings.